So hi, thank you for um, agreeing to come to this workshop. Uh, the, the general concept of a workshop is that we will be doing some work. So I will um, ramble on for a bit, and then you will do some exercises, and then I will ramble on, and then you'll be thrilled to do an exercise. So I stop, and this will repeat until we're done. I did not schedule a break. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I want to try to cover. If you need to leave, go ahead. I'm, I'm not going to have my feelings hurt. If you're a group of five, though, you should negotiate with the group of 12 um, and figure out if you're going to swap around, but I really don't care that much. Um, my slides will be available later at rosel.li slash wceu18. That's R-O-S-E-L dot L-I slash W-C-E-U-18. And at the end of the talk, you'll see the slide again, and I will tweet the URL. You don't have to follow me. I'll put the hashtag on there. If you follow me, you'll just block me really quickly. I have a schedule. I'm going to pretend to follow it. You're already in your groups of five. This is awesome. Quick introduction. This is basically my ego slide. Uh, I, I do talks a bunch and I do trainings as well. I'm terrible at both and this is going to be so much fun as a result. But you should know that if you're listening to me that I, I, I have some experience. I'm not making this crap up and I can't make it up because other people have written it, which is brilliant. Uh, I've, I've done some books. They might be out of print. Uh, I've written for Net Magazine and Web Standards Sherpa. If any of you are old enough to remember evolt.org, that, that was my baby and one of the people who founded that. I have this site, Does My Site Deserve Recognition? Dot org, which you can go get all sorts of resources for doing speed tests and accessibility tests, etc. I have a website where I write um, web-related things. Most of it's accessibility, but I rant about other things. That's my Twitter handle for quick blocking while we're here. I am here because of the courtesy of this incredibly low-contrast Pastiello Group logo that I've chosen. <laughs> And when they see this video, they're going to be frustrated, <laughs> and rightly so. The, the, just, just for context, the Pastiello Group does accessibility consulting, audits, remediation. They have uh, free tools like the Color Contrast Analyzer and the Web Accessibility Toolbar and, and um, Steve Faulkner's Attitude, all of which help the, the standards process. And they, they do a great job participating in standards, HTML, ARIA, WCAG, etc. They were kind enough to bring me on when I left my 20-year venture because I needed health insurance because I'm from America. <laughs> you laugh at that. It makes me uncomfortable. So here's, here's where we start. Uh, we are going to do a group exercise right from the get-go. But this is a pretty straightforward exercise. It isn't a heavy lift. Uh, I'm allotting you... Oh, I should put up the slide that tells you what we're going to do. I'm allotting you 15 minutes. What I want you to do as a group is come up with some sort of user interface component. It could be a login. It could be an accordion. It could be whatever. I just want you to think about what that is. In your group, agree what it is. If you want to describe it, just make a couple notes or sketch it out on paper, whatever is comfortable. It shouldn't take you the full 15 minutes. This is a bit of a buffer I built in. Might only take you a few minutes. I'm going to ask you, after you've agreed on them, what you've chosen, and you're going to hold on to that because whatever it is, we're going to build on this going forward. So maybe don't come up with a super, super weird and complex component because I'm not telling you how to code it. I'm going to try and give you the techniques. And maybe don't come up with a single form field, like first name. Yeah, don't do that. That's just, that's just a cop out. So in your groups, you just joined. We have three groups of five. Um, which, which one would... Oh, you have two extra people. Okay. You, both of you should join a group, and you're both near those two groups, so you're now part of those groups. I feel weird telling people where to go, but I'm American, and it's what we do. Sorry, we're embroiled in a whole border nonsense. Ha, ha, ha. We'll fix that in post-production. So, yes, as groups, please come up with some ideas. Uh, ping me with questions, and as soon as you're done, tell me. And then we'll continue with the show.
education. How's everybody doing so far? How, how are any of the groups done with their rough idea? You think you're you're in good shape? Okay. How about how about you? Middle group? You don't need to sketch it. No, it's as much detail as you want to do because we're going to continue to sort of build through it. Okay. And then I'll check with this last group to see how they are doing. The group on the right. You think you're in a good spot to, to continue? Okay. All right. No pressure. No pressure or anything. Okay, the good news is you're all still working. Maybe I should leave. What are you doing? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, well, everybody is finished, and as soon as I walk away from the table, they start going again. <laughs> this fills me with hope, but it's also the exercise where I gave you the least direction intentionally, and now y'all are going to be really upset as I start to narrow down this focus. You'll be like, oh, come on. We were drawing pictures, and that was fun. <sighs> so I'm going to go through a primer here. Uh, I'm sorry if you have to keep messing with the levels. I'm just all over the map. Did any of you attend Maya's workshop yesterday? Or not workshop, her talk yesterday. Okay. So for, for everybody else, this might be useful. If you've seen the A11Y before, sometimes pronounced Ally, sometimes pronounced Ally, uh, it's just good to know the root of it, uh, primarily because once you see people in the industry talking about it, you won't necessarily mm -hmm. get why we got where we are. If you've ever done any work, um, I've done a lot of work with localization and internationalization, but in the US. So our words are localization, internationalization, and we do L10, I18N. The general gist is you remove all the letters from the middle of the word, 
and you replace all those letters with the count of letters that you replaced, that you removed. So A, 11 for the 11 letters, and then Y. Uh, in particular, this is the hashtag you'll stumble across on Twitter. Found A11Y, hashtag A11Y. Some people also will write accessibility, they'll write some other things as well. Um, it also is used interchangeably to mean accessible because that's easier. Um, and a lot of people can figure that out from context clues. So the good thing is if, if you just want to see currently what people are chatting about uh, on Twitter as an example, hashtag A11Y. And now if you didn't already know, it's a numeronym for accessibility and yay. Uh, World Health Organization has this definition of disability. I like this definition. I think this definition appeals very well to people who work in software, software development. Disability is not just a health problem, it is a complex phenomenon reflecting the interaction between features of a person's body and features of the society in which he or she lives. Features. As people who work with WordPress, work with software, Features are things that we talk about. We understand this concept of features. If we just think of disability as a feature mismatch, I have a feature where I have no legs, but this building doesn't have a feature that makes it easy for me to get in. Maybe it doesn't have a ramp. It's not specifically this building, but many other buildings. I have a feature where I can only see two colors, but all the signage is in red or green they don't have a feature to support my feature set. Um, there's varying success with getting people to think about it that way, but the World Health Organization does a good job of trying to pull it away from being limitations of people and recognize that it's also the limitations of society's inability to recognize, yeah, people have different needs, temporary needs, situational needs, or permanent needs. And I will go through some of those later on. I'm gonna contrast this though with what the World Health Organization's definition was in 1980 for disability. In the context of health experience, a disability is any restriction or lack of ability resulting from an impairment to perform an activity in the manner or within the range considered normal for a human being. So I live in this world where I work on accessibility stuff all the time, and the word normal is a, is a dangerous word. It's not a bad word, but it's a dangerous word. Because as soon as you start making assumptions about what is normal, you're excluding somebody. This isn't just about accessibility, though. I assume it's normal for everybody I work with to have a 5G connection and a totally sweet phone. Um, but that's not normal in the context of a global audience that's very much the opposite of normal. I can expect less than 2G connection off of a rickety feature phone that actually might be more secure than mine. So it's not about a disability, it's about this concept of normal versus not normal. Seeing things through those different lenses and those different perspectives. And that's why I'm such a fan of this redefinition about a feature mismatch between users and the things they use. It's the real world, it's software, it's a box of cereal, it's all those things. I might be the only one who struggles with a box of cereal. <coughs> Any questions on this bit? Okay. I tweeted the agenda earlier today. Um, I wanna manage your expectations about what we're going through today over the course of the next two and a half hours. You've already done one exercise, so that's one out of the way. Um, I did the primer, sort of. I'm going to talk about disability types, how it affects other people. We're gonna break into another exercise. I'll talk a little bit about um, user experience, personas, etc. another exercise. Then there's a big chunk where I'll talk about technical bits, which aren't really technical, but sure. We'll do a, a final exercise and we'll wrap the whole thing up and then you can all go to um, the venue to get drunk. I mean, you might wait a couple hours if you're smart or not, if you can get a cab. Anybody else struggle getting a cab last night? Yeah, okay, glad it wasn't just me. It was very, very wet out.
I found a car service and I managed to get a handful of other people into the cab with me. It worked out well. But we're not here to talk about the woes of uh, bus route 95 and local car services. We're here to talk about this stuff. So I put together a, a list of disability types, just a, a high level list. Uh, general concept here is everybody's different, no two people are alike. And we tend to forget that there are a lot of different things that people can do or feel or perceive than we're used to. Normal versus not normal. So there are physical impairments, some examples, epilepsy, mobility impairment, which could be confined to a wheelchair, confined is the wrong word, do not use it, but a wheelchair user. Uh, maybe fine motor skills, they don't have precision. Hearing, deaf, hard of hearing. Hard of hearing itself can break down in multiple ways. They struggle with mid-range or high-range, high-end sounds. Uh, there are buildings in, in America where they keep kids from hanging out after school by playing really high-pitched sounds through speakers. And only kids like 18 and younger hear it, and they're like, I don't want to be here. Sounds stupid. And then uh, people in my age bracket can't hear it. So we get to chill and skateboard outside the building. You don't, you don't think I can skateboard? Uh, vision, color blindness, low vision. Low vision comes in many flavors. Uh, I'll touch on some of those as well. And then there's full blindness. And we tend to break these apart, which I will show momentarily as well. Cognitive is a lot tougher because it, it manifests in so many different ways. And whether or not you like it, we all have cognitive issues. Um, I guarantee you at the end of tonight, you will all have cognitive issues. <laughs> Just saying. ADD, uh, attention deficit disorder, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, autism, which itself is a huge scale that uh, manifests in a lot of different ways. Dyslexia, which is struggling with reading <laughs> Text can be confusing what the letters and the shapes are. Dyscalculia is the numbers version of dyslexia. You struggle when you look at the numbers. And then general learning and language. Um, it turns out I don't speak Serbian. I, I just discovered that. I was so cocky when I flew here. I'm like, this is going to be all right. Uh, and then speech. And speech is becoming more and more prominent because we are moving more and more to voice interfaces. I have a thing in my house that when I ask it the weather, it tells me. And fortunately, it can understand me. People who stutter, people who might be nonverbal, cluttering, apraxia, all these are things that can limit their ability to use some of these newer interfaces. The very fact of you asking me caused my brain to blank on it. Oh. I'm going to look that up during the break and get back to you. When I put it in here, I was like, oh, everybody. Eh. I didn't even make a note for myself. Uh, we are going to talk about the disability types broken down this way, as these six. Now, conveniently, I asked you to break into groups of five, but some of you are groups of six. This might become relevant in our next exercise. Blindness. Low vision, including color blindness, separate from blindness, deaf and hard of hearing, speech, physical, intellectual, and cognitive. These are the groupings that we're going to keep today. And I'm going to run through attributes of each of these. A blind user cannot see the screen. As simple as that. If you're blind, you just can't see the screen. You can't see the keyboard, you can't see the mouse. Your way of using a computer navigating the world, interacting with people is, is dramatically different. You are probably a, key, a, a screen reader user, which means you rely on the computer to talk to you. The computer talks to you based on what the software tells it to say. So whoever wrote that software hopefully did a really good job. Oh, by the way, they didn't. Um, you're also a keyboard only user. A mouse user is not using a, I'm, I'm sorry, a blind user is not using a mouse. It's totally impractical. Now there's a little bit of an exception to the keyboard only user. If you're using a mobile device or a touch screen, a lot of blind people have keyboards 
I have a, a Bluetooth keyboard that I use with this all the time because I don't want to pull out my laptop. But at the same time, there's something called explore by touch or just uh, swipe right. It's not a Tinder reference. I discovered that the hard way. Um, oh good, you know what Tinder is. <laughs> Awkward. Um, but they literally tab through as if they're pressing a tab key by just over and over and over. So they're not keyboard users, but their interaction might be very similar to a keyboard user. As such, they rely on a web page, core thing we're here talk about, talking about. They rely on a web page that has good headings. They want that, the, the headings on the page to make sense. It tells them where they are. It gives them context for where they are in the page at any time. Proper form elements, native form elements, ideally. You can still code custom brand new form elements, but you run the risk of breaking them and making them inaccessible. Good old fashioned links. Links are great, especially when the link text is useful, takes people places, they know what to expect. And landmarks. Cool thing about landmarks is they come in HTML5, they come for free, and I'll review some of those later on in the technical section. Low vision users, separate from blind users. Low vision users rely on different technologies than blind users, for the most part. They may use a screen reader. We know from some surveys, which are not the same as rigorous studies, but still very helpful, we know from surveys of screen reader users that only two-thirds of them are blind. That means a full third of screen reader users either have low vision or aren't blind at all, or have any, any vision issues, and maybe they use it for, to, for cognitive reasons. They might have dyslexia. So not all screen reader users are blind. Windows has a high contrast mode built right into it. If you're using Windows high contrast mode, you're probably using it with Microsoft Edge or Internet Explorer because they natively support it. And they do a lot of cool things with system colors. Uh, low vision users may not be able to differentiate colors. They might be red green color blind, uh, blue green. They might be monochromatic. They might not be able to see any color. Low vision users may scale fonts. The base font of their system might be bigger. They may also zoom in on a page. They may use a screen magnifier. Screen magnifier is kind of tricky because it only shows you part of the screen at a time. So if you are, if you're, if you've zoomed in this portion and something important happens down here, you're not going to see it, even if it only happens to the right. They tend to rely on good contrast and scaling typefaces. These, the good contrast is particularly true for pretty much everybody who has uh, vision issues, and it's worth noting that low vision. Um, not just colorblind, but I was going to mention a couple others. There's the uh, where the center of your field of vision is gone. There's variation where the periphery of your field of vision is gone. There's also uh, cases where everything's very blurry or there are a lot of floaters in their view. The point is there's no one single type of low vision. Um, one example that, that I've seen used a few times is just look through a straw. Just experience looking through a straw and how difficult it might be to use your software. Another is smearing Vaseline on your screen. Also from practical experience, don't do that to your coworkers. They frown on that. Deaf and hard of hearing. They will not hear audio cues. If you have a web page or software that beeps or blurps or makes other weird noises to alert them of something, they're not going to know. So you have to bear in mind ear cons, as some people call them, will be useless. If you have captions for your video and they are not synchronized, they may struggle to understand what's going on in the scene. If somebody's, if, if the captions are showing up um, a few seconds after the person who spoke, it might look like a different person is speaking or they might not understand what else is on the screen and how it's relevant. In the case of um, American Sign Language, that might be their first language. If they were born deaf, They've never spoken English. They, they might read English, but their first language is a symbolic language. It's sign language. And it's not just American sign language, there's British sign language, there's Dutch sign language, and, and on and on and on. So you still have all the translation issues that come along with that as well. They tend to rely on good captions that are clear and concise, visual cues, color cues, and haptic cues. 
So if I have a phone and I'm getting email and it dings, I'm not going to hear it, but I will feel it vibrate if I'm carrying it. Uh, on Mac OS, if uh, I go into the accessibility settings, I can enable a feature that whenever my Mac makes a sound, the screen flashes. And when the screen flashes, I don't need to have heard it, just a quick flash, and I do what I need to do. And uh, one of the guys I work with relies on that because he often works in loud spaces. And it makes it much easier for him to know that he's got an alert because there's a, a quick flash. Single strobe, no risk of anything bad happening there. This is me checking to make sure I'm not falling behind. Because if I'm behind, you're all getting to drinks later. That's bad news. Speech. Uh, somebody with a speech impairment may speak less clearly. They may also be nonverbal. They might not speak at all. They might even be capable of speaking, but not have the understanding of how to make words. They can be stymied by voice interfaces. Uh, phone interaction may not be possible. So call our number if you have a problem with our website. Nope. Uh, those uh, voice menus, say one to call or say zero to speak to a representative. Nope. The worst would be somebody who's nonverbal with a rotary phone. Anybody remember rotary phones? Yeah, that'd be terrible. Uh, and they may use assistive technology, and they may use it in, in ways that you did not consider. Uh, but typically they rely on other interactions. A lot of visual interactions, a lot of cues from color, a lot of cues from visual texture. So some of that, um, uh, 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 what's the word for interfaces that look like they're based on real world stuff? I'm sorry? Skeuomorphic, Skew yes. Which in retrospect, I can't expect non-English speakers to know skeuomorphic. So interfaces that look like stuff you can grab or slide. I heard that. That's unsettling. Um, and, and I think I said haptic as well. Physical impairments. Uh, these are interesting because they can, they can vary in ways that you might not expect. They can be temporary to permanent. Somebody can start off with a, a physical limitation and maybe through lack of use of the limb or a lack of physical therapy, they start to lose more and more use of it and end up having a permanent physical disability. Slight to severe is one where uh, not only, did I mention it? Yes, I do mention it. So you can have a, a slight impairment. You know, you might just have a funky wrist. You might have been typing too much and you have carpal tunnel and after a couple of years it gets to the point you just can't operate a keyboard. So that starts off slight and then severe. These things, temporary to permanent, slight to severe, can change throughout the course of a day. If you have tremors, your tremors might start off pretty mild in the morning, but as the day progresses, they get more and more severe and it becomes harder and harder to do some basic tasks. Opening a jar might be easy first thing in the morning and impossible by lunch or dinner time. They may use a screen reader because it's, it's just easier. It's, it's just a couple keyboard interactions in order to read an entire screen, to scroll, to do things like that. It, it's just an easier interface in many cases. They may also use dictation software. Uh, something like Dragon Dictate, which is technically not assistive technology. If, if you have the opportunity, and I did not put any links into this, um, Eric Wright did a demo of using dictation software to walk through Gutenberg. And while it is mostly a, um, an example of how problematic, problematic Gutenberg is for dictation software, it's also, ignore my banana, it's also um, a good example of seeing somebody use dictation software with an interface that you might already know to some extent. It gives you some insight into how he uses it. Uh, somebody with a physical impairment probably relies on generous hit areas. If I have limited mobility or if I have tremors or I'm using a, a wand or some other thing, the bigger the button, the better. More likely I am to hit it. And simpler interactions. So drag and drops could be a real problem for those users. Intellectual and cognitive. This is a really broad category and trying to squeeze it into one slide does a disservice, just as all the others into one slide does a disservice to them. 
Somebody with an intellectual or cognitive challenge may use a screen reader. It might be easier to have a web page spoken to you than trying to read it. The typography might be terrible. Uh, your dyslexia might be kicking in and it's just impossible to understand. They may also use dictation software for the same reason. It might be just difficult to, to form a sentence by typing it. They might benefit from anything I've already covered. All these things, larger hit areas, good captions, etc. these are all things that can benefit them depending on, on their needs. They tend to rely on well-structured content, some good headings, clear understanding of what the page looks like, what it is they're getting themselves into, uh, plain language, and good context. Am I at a form? What is this form doing? Is it structured? What am I filling out? Did I just buy something I don't want? How do I, how do I return it? Very simple, direct questions. Uh, I do have notes here, but again, none for apraxia of speed. Oh, I'm just gonna... So I've talked about people who have disabilities as we think of them. Um, before I jump into this next section, I'd also like to point out one thing I, I did not dedicate a slide to is the notion that disabilities often come in sets. You don't have just one. Often the thing that caused you to have that disability has other effects as well. So if you're confined to a wheelchair, again, don't use the word confined. I'm trying to sort of be a better example myself. You might be there because you have no physical mobility and you can't speak. So now you've got two impairments. Um, there are plenty of people on the web who are deafblind. They can neither hear nor see, but they still manage to get by if something is well-coded. Um, and if you think about the causes of some of these things, you can start to see where some of that overlap might live. So we're going to jump into talking about who else. Uh, I, I want to make sure that we're sort of leaving the disability stereotypes and generalizations behind. Did any of you go to Paris, WordCamp Paris last year? Did any of you see my talk last year at WordCamp Paris? You can put your heads down for the next few minutes. Some of these slides will be familiar, but not all of them. Uh, this one I want to pull out immediately uh, because I maintain that Microsoft, this is Microsoft's art. I maintain they stole the concept from me. They will disagree. But I've been talking about this concept of everybody has an impairment. Everybody's got some sort of limitation. It's all about context. It's all about situational. It's all about temporary, etc. cetera. And this, these illustrations, these animated illustrations they have uh, on their site, I think do a good job of referencing some of the things that people might be struggling with. I like the bartender who can't hear because he's got the shaker. Just all night with the ice and the shaker. So let's jump into one of the first ones, getting older. Um, it is my understanding that it affects everybody, except for those who are fortunate enough to not have to get older, because they're dead. This is a tough room. Um, as I note, it carries risks and side effects. It is not for the young. But the, the concept is very simple. The very fact that we're sitting here means that we are spending time aging. Uh, you can blame me for that, but you started it. So this is an example of two couples. What, what is separating these two couples besides about four feet of concrete? Age. Age. Sorry? Something like 40 years. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. They're, they're probably both having the same conversation. Hey, I've never been to Serbia before. <laughs> Where's a good vegetarian restaurant? And again, their objectives aren't necessarily different. Their interactions aren't necessarily different. The only difference is age. Um, what's separating these two besides the, about a foot of metal? Age. Well, they're both reading. Sorry? Yes. So I'm going to go with the interface. I maintain that they're separated by age, and she's the smarter of the two because she's using a solar-powered device, and the interface tells her how much more there is left to read at a glance. Right? That's brilliant. But it, 
It is heavier to carry, but it's also a weapon. <laughs> and if it gets cold, you can burn it, and it's not as dangerous to burn as this. So, you know, it has that going for it. But again, they are separated just by time, by age. Same objectives, same goals, they're trying to do the same things. Now, forget about the whole aging part. Um, if you live long enough, you're probably going to have some sort of an accident. Something's going to happen to you. Uh, broken limbs, eye injuries, hearing injuries, head trauma. All of these apply to me. I've been through all of these. I've broken multiple parts of my body and split things open and shed blood across the world. Don't do that. It gets expensive. But the point is, we all have something happen to us. Carpal tunnel affects a lot of people. A broken wrist affects a lot of people. I'm, I'm the guy who took a spill coming out of the, the, the Bell Expo Center yeah. the other day. Well, you, you were ahead of me. You didn't see it. You just heard everyone laughing at me. One, one foot and down hard. And I caught myself, but you know, there's a few minutes afterward where I'm reminded I'm getting older and my wrists don't like it when I fling myself into concrete. Eye surgery, having a little bit of work done, poking yourself in the eye with one of the postcards I'm going to fling at everybody later on. You know, you've temporarily lost um, some of your vision, peripheral vision, and your 3D sense, which means you could be standing in the elevator tonight going, because I've, I've done that. These guys are my favorite. You would not know, looking at them, that they're actually all okay right now. Granted, they may have some cognitive decline. What they're doing is they're chasing a wheel of cheese down a hill. This is a tradition in some town in England, and I didn't copy those notes over. Um, what I do know is they start at the top of a hill, somebody kicks a wheel of cheese down, they all run after it, and a half dozen ambulances wait at the bottom of the hill. And they need to be there because somebody always gets injured, and multiple somebodies. So you have this very clear, at the top of the picture, you start off okay. By the time you get to the bottom of the picture, guess what? You're disabled. And it's your damn fault. You can't blame the cheese. You could try. It just wouldn't be effective. You could think that, uh, like me, you're invincible and allergic to nothing. But there are other factors that can give you this temporary or situational impairment. Uh, multitasking. Lots of people like to think that they can multitask. Nobody can multitask. All you can do is attention swap, and that is problematic for a number of reasons. Uh, work in the sunlight. Um, not so much of an issue these last couple days, but it can wash out your screen. Incidentally, if it rains on your screen, your phone thinks you're, every one of those raindrops is a touch, and next thing you know, you've sent an email. What did, did I resign? Uh, eating at your desk not having headphones handy in an open office plan workplace or a cafe, or if the content is not in your native language. I tried to use, a, uh, on Contributor Day, I tried to use Maya's laptop really quickly, and it's a German layout. And I got two letters in, and I was like, what? where's the letter? I didn't know what to do. I couldn't find the slash. You know, you, you know how it, it's, it's the slash. So confused. So this, this is sort of a representation of me a lot. One hand's on the mouse or one hand's on the keyboard and the other hand's holding food. I maintain that everybody is a keyboard only user at lunchtime. We all have experience with it, we just don't think about it. Uh, these guys are awesome because they're neither mouse nor keyboard user. They're not really paying attention to the screens. They're working out in the sun, they're distracted. If you send them an extremely detailed email with a set of instructions they have to follow to, to not be killed by the man-eating tarp, they're not going to understand it because they're too distracted. So they have this temporary cognitive impairment, visual impairment, motor impairment. So they've, they've heaped these on themselves. There's nothing wrong with this, but again, it's understanding that, that context and that temporary situation. Working in a cafe, probably doing some video editing, based on the video camera, so he has to wear the earphones. I'm glad he's wearing earphones because I hate that guy on the train who decides to watch that YouTube video and turns it all the way up and is like, yeah, dude, I heard that song. That's cool, you got any Duran Duran? So 
This affects a lot of people. Headphones can become really, really important, and when you don't have them is when you suddenly realize how much you want them. And until then, that person is essentially deaf. Uh, BBC's app does this really cool thing where it recognizes when you're on a phone, and it, in many cases, starts the captions by default. Because it's like you're on a phone, you're probably not sitting on your couch. So we're just going to turn the captions on, and maybe you won't have your volume all the way up. There is um, the scenario of having somebody in bed with you. You know, checking email at you know midnight, not so cool. Watching terrible videos, playing video games, not awesome. I'd like to think that this bedmate is a little bit more understanding. But this is a case where suddenly captions are important. Brightness of screen is a factor. How much you move around on the bed can you even have a mouse on that blanket? These are all limiting factors. Uh, this kind of represents me on a few trips. Be before I would get um, airline apps on my phone, when I was traveling internationally and I'd have to print a boarding pass, it meant I would have to go to some internet cafe or post office or library and mess around with a keyboard that I've never seen before and try and type words I've never seen before um, I've been fortunate because I've always been Latin characters, but then you all throw Cyrillic text at me. Where's the where's the weird circle post? Where I don't know where that is on the keyboard. So I'm suddenly very comfortable in English and very comfortable with a keyboard. I'm rendered useless in front of an international system. It takes me way too long to get anything done. Uh, in America, we have Thanksgiving, where we give thanks for. Um, murdering millions of natives and then eating turkey in their honor, I think. Um, but we all get together. It's a family holiday. We all get together. We have lots of food. And when I go to my parents' house, the first thing they do is hand me um, a printer ink cartridge. It's out of ink. Can you please change printer ink? And then, you know, run the virus updates and install other things and delete email and was that a virus and why is this popping up? This is, this is, we're talking a little bit about cognitive and intellectual and experience and all these other factors. We have to remember that not everybody who uses the stuff we build is as skilled as we are. I've been writing software poorly for over 20 years. I stopped counting when I hit 20 because it's embarrassing. And what I have learned is that I've written a lot of terrible stuff, even when I was trying my best. And this is an ongoing thing. It's ongoing. We all, we all go through this. It's, it's just how it is. You want to have good mentors who lead you through this stuff. But eventually, we're going to be in their position. We're not going to be writing software anymore. We're going to be the end user. We're not going to have that kind of control. So think about what you want to leave behind for future you. I don't know if anybody... Yeah. So here's the good news. This is where we roll into a... Another group exercise. This is the second group exercise. I'm a little bit ahead of schedule. I'm so surprised by this. So surprised by this. So I'm just going to stand here for 10 minutes? <laughs> of course you can. You can ask questions anytime. Don't ask me about something I don't know again, though. That was embarrassing. Right, but then without the bar, they fell into the vat anyway? What? Sorry? No? They, no. They, okay. But, but the, the environmental like, uh, part said you have to keep it to prevent the floods from coming out and have environment. So it was like, what, what do you follow? So yeah. you have these situations when you sort of do stuff for one group? And yes. Yeah, you can have these situations. And that's why uh, part of this approach is you have to look at this broader picture. So if, if all I do is, is I look at um, WCAG 
and just try to code to WCAG, I'm going to create some problems because you need to apply a little bit of smarts to it. Um, I talked about hearing impaired. They tend to rely on color cues. Well, if the only thing you do is leave color cues, you've excluded another audience. And so I talk a little bit about that later on, how to try to make sure that you're covering for more than one at a time. Uh, but the general gist is, yeah, there is always that risk. And hopefully, as you approach these, you can think about, when I do this, who am I going to leave behind? Uh, we are at 5-2. I did the disability types. I'm down to group exercise, which I should be starting in five minutes. This is awesome. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, you can take your seat. But thank you for, for attending. Have somebody bring you the homework later. Okay, so this is crazy. It's the same number of people in that group. So here's your next group exercise. Each person in your group should pick a disability type. You're weirdly numbered groups, so this throws things off a little bit. So, and Rian, you're not going to be this person. Rian, you might be low vision. And Monique, you might be blindness. And whatever, each of you, hearing, hearing and speech, I paired up because it's a little bit more difficult and also conceptually a little bit easier, but you can split those up if you want. Uh, physical and cognitive. So each person in your group, choose one of those, discuss amongst yourselves, draw straws, fist fight, I don't really care. Within your group, what I want you to do is discuss where each of your needs as a representative of one of these groups overlaps with the needs of someone else based on all the information I've just presented through these slides. Be a little bit creative, think about if you are one of these categories where you're gonna bump into somebody else. Barriers, abilities, needs, weird software interfaces, favorite foods, maybe not that last one. And you have 15 minutes to come up with Basically a list. Basically 15 minutes, chat about it. I'll walk around, answer questions. Any questions before you get started? Yeah, that's what I thought. Hello, hello, hello. Wait, did I not mute?
Send button or Yeah, I'm going to 
fight him. called to say hello okay we're going to pick it up again I appreciate how passionate you are to want to go through this all right you guys I know you're getting into it but here's what I'm going to do be before we move into the next section is I'm going to ask somebody from each group to do something in the yellow shirt, what what disability type were you championing? Uh, eye type uh, three. I'm sorry? Uh, eye type uh, three. Hearing. Yeah. Okay. So tell me, what overlaps did you have for hearing that some of the others had? You stuck on hearing? Oh, I see. You got as far as blindness. So 15 minutes was not enough. Okay. So then who was... You had low vision? Yeah. Why don't you tell me one of the overlaps you had, since that's the first one on the list. So, so obviously I had lots of overlaps with blindness. Uh, with blindness, yep. Overlaps with blindness. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, and also cognitive as well. Um, cognitive? Um, what, what kind of an overlap with Cognitive. Okay, you might use a screen reader, right? Okay, I'm I'm repeating these things for the benefit of the recording as well. This will this will be captioned later on, and and you'll and then you can read me justifying why I'm talking so much. It's very weird, I know, in the future. Okay, um, what was your chosen your your chosen disability type? Okay. I'm sorry. I'm like Tommy. Like Tommy. Oh, the the um, musical. Yes. No, I didn't see it. It's for hippies. Anyway. Okay. So overlaps with cognitive. What kind of overlaps? Okay, captions. Yeah. Then, uh, as I said, visual feedback. Like, when I press the button, I may not see a lot that I press the button on the mouse. Right, so visual That's feedback, that. you don't hear the mouse click. Yeah. Right, so you need... Uh, change the stuff somehow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Ok
Okay. Um, what else? Uh, you were thinking at some time, uh, I would like to see things instead of hearing them. You'd like to see instead of hear something. So, sometimes video uh, instructions may be uh, better than audio instructions. Oh, video instructions better than just listening to instructions. Yes. So you can see what's going on. I'm hearing the group say structure. Is the group saying structure? You just kept coming back to structure. So uh, for, for context for the other two tables, I think they're anchored on structure because uh, Monique made a matrix where she put check marks for each of the, the disability types and where there were little overlaps. Um, that's not a criticism. Any, any tactic that works that helps you uh, get to map some of that stuff is great. Doesn't mean anybody did anything wrong or right. I mean, Monique maybe did something right. So I think my overlaps, the ones we uh, discovered, yeah. kind of maybe did. Okay. You had an overlap with physical. You had an overlap with physical. I think we did. You can't hear the car horn before it runs you down in the street. Now you can see. That's why I started to make the main thing. Okay. Because it all got a bit confusing. Um, it does get confusing, doesn't it? Yeah. No, I think I had overlap with blindness because, uh, for instance, when my arm was hurting, I don't want to hold the book because it's heavy. I know it's a weapon, but it's heavy. right. And so I'd like to hear. So with the with a broken arm, holding a heavy book, if you could just have it spoken to you, that would be easier. It would be easier. Yeah. Yeah. So you might use the same technology somebody who's blind yeah. might use. Yeah. Okay. Or I'm, I'm, we keep coming back to video instructions. I feel like you guys have been doing lots of tutorials. <laughs> this is potentially compelling. I, I want to watch this YouTube channel. I hope it's cooking related. And uh, you looked at me first. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so I got blindness. You got blindness, okay. Okay, so you need to be somewhere quiet enough yeah. that you can, it doesn't drown out the screen reader yeah. that you're listening to. And that's the uh, overlap thing with the cognitive, that uh, maybe someone with dyslexia wants to uh, do the screen reader, so they maybe... Right, someone with dyslexia relies on having it spoken instead yeah. of reading. And uh, with your video, because we have uh, a lot of uh, overlap. And also, um, the structure, we... Structure. Right? Uh, Structure is always good. Yes. Uh, either if uh, we do the screen reader and we want to restrict the parts that uh, we are interested in the book, or uh, for a cognitive, if they have uh, um, uh, ADD. ADD? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and they need uh, some, stru uh, some uh, structured problems to. So, structure is helpful not just for screen readers, but for somebody with ADD who needs to be able to just quickly yeah. jump into a section. Uh, Smaller form text, like simpler, yeah. simpler instructions, yeah, and more to the point, that direct, you know. yeah. And also uh, that they can do very small devices, uh, which overlap also with your uh, notebook and uh, physical. So and smaller, physical, smaller devices, yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, you know, fine uh, movements. Mm -hmm. Intellectual, low vision overlaps. Okay. I, I think what the goal of the exercise is to get you thinking about for each of those disability types, what are the things that you can struggle with or leverage from another disability type? And as I mentioned before, disabilities come in sets. Often they're matched sets, sometimes they don't match. So you, you have to sort of prime yourself as you're building this thing into your question earlier, Monique, about can you build something? for one and end up excluding another. Yes, you can. 
an exercise like this is the goal of an exercise like this is to have you thinking about more ways and if each of you champions one disability type ideally you can point out to somebody else in your team oh hey that's going to be a problem and then you start to have those kinds of conversations and this can work within an organization it can work within a team it can work in chat rooms on the internet whatever works for you um, before I jump into the next section, do you have any questions so far? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to defer your question. Uh, screen reader question for the benefit of, of captioning later. I'm going to defer that question until we get to the technical section because there might be some stuff in there that, that I explained that answers it and then you can ask me a, a question to really stump me when I don't answer it because that's always more hilarious. Anything else on what we've gone through so far? Okay. We're going to talk about user experience models. Uh, I, I want to qualify if any of you does any work with personas and user stories what you're about to see for these next few slides is not quite right. I'm greatly oversimplifying an entire industry and area of practice into a handful of slides, but it's because I want to get you thinking about it a little bit more abstractly. At its simplest, at its very simplest, user stories are talking about a particular user, the outcome that user wants, and the value what value the user gets from that outcome. And they're often written, as user, I want outcome. As user, I want outcome, so that value. In order to get value as user, I want outcome. As some examples, as a user on a sunlit patio, I want to be able to read the content and see the controls. I'm not talking about a disability I'm talking about a situational or a temporary impairment. As a user in bed with a sleeping spouse, I want to watch a training video in silence so that I can get caught up at work. Not a disability, just a temporary situation. In order to click links, as a user with no elbow room and coach class with a tiny trackpad, I want click areas to be large enough and adequately spaced. If any of you flew here and worked at all on that flight, Maybe this is familiar to you. Also, you know, they leave the visor open and the sun's on half your screen and then turbulence and then somebody spills water. And yeah, terrible working. And there's a baby shrieking. They don't give you any more noodles. As a user distracted by the television, I want clear headings and labels so that I don't lose my place. Back to structure. These are really, really oversimplified. I get that. There are these um, really cool personas that are pre-written that, that you use to feed into these user stories. These personas were put together by Sarah Horton from the Paciello Group and Whitney Quessenberry. They did it for the book, A Web for Everyone. The cool thing is these personas are free for you to download. They're available, uh, I wanna say they're at uxmag.com. There's a link in the, in the slides which you will get later. But these are pre-written personas for people with disabilities. They're awesome because now you can hear about Leah and Leah lives with fatigue and pain. And now you're not just as user, whatever, you can say as Leah, I want to be able to shop online, but it's very difficult with my, with my wrists to be able to type in all the stuff you ask for on the shopping cart. So you've identified who the person is. That's where personas control that can bring the, the, uh, the greatest value. They're a, they're a way to try to convey empathy. They're a way to put names with some of these collections of disabilities. There's always a catch though in that organizations that rely on personas will often throw away the disability personas. They're trying to get down to three personas, five personas, somewhere in that number. And when they do that, they're going to take Leah, they're going to take Vishnu, and they're going to say, no, we don't, we don't need to worry about uh, Vishnu who has low vision or Leah with fatigue and pain. It doesn't represent all of our users. So you have to get a little bit creative. 
I suggest that at the very least you take a look at my talk from last year, Selfish Accessibility, where I pitched the idea of taking some of these concepts I've talked about, temporary and situational impairments, and folding them into your existing user stories. The trick is to think about who your stakeholders are and think about their situations. If I'm a stakeholder on your product, if I'm a stakeholder for your team, if I'm a person who signs off on what personas can be there, or I'm C-level and I rely on the software doing what I want, I don't even need to see the personas, but if I'm represented in some way, I'm more likely to go along with it. This might be my persona if I'm that guy. Uh, I work when I should be relaxing. I relax when I should work. I have a weird way of doing things. It's very inefficient and frustrating. I live between motorcycles, so as a result, I have the uh, captions on my television all the time because these guys like to rev their motorcycles and show off whose muffler is worse. It's a thing. So I can't always hear. They'll, they'll start that up on a summer evening when I'm watching something, and if I don't have captions on, I miss as long as it takes me to find the closed captions button. Uh, I work late at night with the television on. I need some white noise, that means I can be easily distracted or I can work for long periods. I use subtitles in Netflix. I keep all of my screens as dark as possible. Uh, in the case of my phone, I keep my screen as dark as possible because I'm saving battery. Because I will just burn through battery. Swipe right. Not really, maybe. Um, same thing with my laptop. The, the, the darker I can keep the screen, the more battery I'm going to save. But on top of that, I don't like scorching my retinas. You, know, you need that your work environment, the screen should be as bright as the surrounding environment, otherwise you're causing eye fatigue, etc. And turning down the brightness is a great way to do to, to uh, help with that. So this might be me as your stakeholder. You might have a stakeholder on your project or a C-level executive or a high-level person or a client who always works on the train. That person commutes every day. That person sends email from the quiet car or from a random spot on the train. Maybe, maybe she's always coming in on first class over a border. Awesome, maybe account for that. Maybe write your persona to reference that trait, that she's in a noisy car, that um, the train's always bumping around, that there's always this distraction of other people, that it can get loud in there. When you write those into the story, when you make those part of the description of your persona, in this narrative section, you're going to get more buy-in. You're going to get more stakeholders and clients who see themselves represented in the things that you're trying to solve. This makes it easier to try and ensure that those personas and later those user stories are represented because you're not representing a disability type. You're representing the temporary or situational disabilities that the people who make these decisions experience all the time. Did I lose anybody on that? How many of you work with personas? Okay. So how many of you are offended at my really compressed version of personas and then rejiggering them? That's very nice of you to say. You know there's no grade in here. You just, you just sort of hang out and do stuff. Um, what's funny is I've gone through that a little bit faster than I expected. But the good news is this is where we're going to our third group exercise. We're doing four group exercises. This is the third one. So, you know, if you're still awake, this is good. What I want you to do is, as a group, develop a persona. It's a proto-persona. It's a virtual persona. It's a crap persona. It's not a professional persona. But I want you to come up with somebody, assign a name, assign an age, maybe a job, come up with a quick interest or what the person is about, and then just come up with a couple user stories for your persona that relate to that interface that you're putting together. So if, if you've put together, um, if you put together a pizza ordering screen, I'm simplifying from, I'm forking off a little bit from e-commerce. You know, as, as, a, as Leah, who can't go to the pizza store, I want to be able to get pizza without having to talk to somebody on the phone because they're always a bunch of jerks. Okay, that is a user story. So, simple persona, name, age, quick, quick narrative, 
come up with a couple user stories related to your interface. You have 15 minutes to go do that, and I will walk around to answer questions. How do I hope? Hey, hello, hello, hello. I thought I hit mute. I'm sorry.
the accessibility world, we consider eyeglasses to be assistive technology because it, it's true, it really is, but it, it also normalizes half of the people at this table are using assistive yeah. technology. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, I can tell how excited everybody is about their fake person. I look forward to being picked up in the Marvel Universe. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, hand a microphone to the first group. I'm going to start because you're on my left. I'm going to, st and then um, you will tell me, you will read off the bits about your persona and user stories. You're looking at me. Does that mean you're doing it? Because I want to get this captioned as well. Uh -huh, okay. Okay. Folks, party, other, hey, team on the right side. She's going to start reading off her persona and we're going to continue this exercise. So, please. So, um, I'm Hannah. I'm 26 years old. And uh, I have low vision. Basically, I, ha I am astigmatic. Um, so, uh, my interests are, um, I'm an outgoing person, I like dancing. Um, on the other hand, I like to stay at home and watch Netflix. Um, I, I am outgoing, but I don't like going to cinema. Uh, I like Netflix because they have uh, the titles that I can uh, see very well. On the other hand, I studied psychology. I went to college, so uh, I passed my exams and I'm uh, now looking for a job, sending CVs online uh, and resumes. Um, my aspirations, uh, because I live in a mid-city, I um, live with my parents and I want to be more independent in the future. So I want to move out and get uh, more incomes. Um, and I want to teach psychology online in the future and, uh, and also uh, to be a psycho uh, psychologic assistant in okay. uh, school. So that, are, that would be my aspirations for the future. So. Okay, that's, that's Hannah. Yep. Okay, I like that. Thank you. I, I look forward to um, when we integrate Hannah into the next round. Oh. Does, does Hannah have any videos on YouTube of dancing? Um, I understand no. there's money in it. No. No? Okay. No. Who from this group is going to take the microphone and report? Don't make me drop it. Okay. Um, so we have Matt. Matt is uh, 72 years old. He uh, doesn't live near shops and is uh, not good with technology. Um, he's also, yeah, he can, he can afford uh, to have a car. Um, he likes to eat healthy and cheap food, uh, and he is a vegetarian. Um, he's uh, pensioned and he likes to read. <laughs> uh, and as Matt, I want to order groceries online so that I can feed myself. Yep, good um, idea. <laughs> And I, as Matt, I want to clear. I want clear instructions on how to order my groceries online, so that I, 
able to place an order and understand. And as met, I want to see what I'm spending so that I can stay within budget. Uh, as met, I want to see personalized discounts so that I can spend my money wisely and eat diversely. And as met, I want to see the ingredients so that I can make sure to eat healthy. That was it. Okay. I feel like Matt should go out clubbing with Hannah. <laughs> they might have a really good time. Who from this table is going to report? Because you were looking at your phone, she, you got nominated. I don't. Oh. Okay, okay. so I, our person is Andriana. Uh, she's uh, 31 years old. She lives in Belgrade, and she's not married, but she has a cat. Uh, she is dyslexic. Uh, but she didn't know uh, growing up that she's dyslexic, so uh, as a result, she's not that educated. Uh, she has a physical job as a cleaning lady, and uh, she recently uh, fell on a slippery surface at work and broke her right hand, uh, and it's uh, the hand that she's using, so it's uh, what's some troubling. Um, and now uh, she wants to sign up for um, an online course to educate herself more. And uh, so uh, she wants to take a course to expand her, her education so that she can get a better job and quality of life. Uh, and at the same time, she uh, wants to apply online for um, a public as assistant uh, until she's uh, capable of uh, working again. Ah, and she also has to apply to uh, online to get a certificate by a doctor, and she needs to go online and do some paperwork. We try to relate it to the formula. Right. Okay. A Adriana was her name? Yes. It's a lovely name. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that nobody came up with a pirate because I've seen that in some of these exercises before. Pirate, Pete, he's got one leg and he's blind in one eye, he's missing. Well, he wasn't blind in his eye until a bird pooped in it and he only had the hook, so yeah. Anyway, um, so, so far you have come up with a rough idea of an interface element. You've talked about some of the overlapping needs and challenges for different disability types, and you've put together a persona, a very lightweight persona of a user of that thing. So all of that's in your head, and I'm sure you can guess that when we come around to the final exercise, we're gonna pull that all together. But in order to pull that all together, I have to go through 60 slides in 12 minutes. I misread that, I misread that. But I have a pile of slides to go through, and this is what I generally call the, the technical bits. This is not going to be highly technical. There's gonna be some code references in here. Uh, for those of you who have specific code questions, you wanna get into the weeds on stuff, I'll answer what I can that doesn't blow up the timeline I'm trying to keep. And then for any more technical questions, which are sometimes my favorite questions, we can table those until afterward and I can, I can chat with you now or after you've gotten me sufficiently drunk, which will be a problem because I don't drink. But you can try, I mean, it'd be hilarious. I actually, with an, enough Coca-Colas, I'm a mess. So we're gonna dive right into what I will call the technical bits. Uh, right off the bat, images. If you're relying on images in your pages, you need to account for what happens when the image does not display. And that image could not display because the user can't see it, because the network is broken, because you coded it poorly, any number of factors. You need to have text alternative. Can you still make sense of the page if that image is missing? If not, you might have a bit of a problem. Is content missing? As in, did you have a piece of text that was in that image? That's also a problem, you, you really shouldn't be doing that. Can you still use the site if the images disappear? This isn't just inline image tags, but also CSS background images. This counts for icons, however you generate them. I'm using a broader term here. You have weird gradients that come together. You're doing like one pixel, or I'm sorry, a single div Pac-Man 
like super high detail stuff, still if it doesn't appear, you got the same problem. When you do provide alternative text, is it useful? Does it make sense to the user within the context of the page, that piece of the screen, and potentially even outside of it? Do you account for CSS background images? Are you using sprites, pixel sprites? And what happens when that sprite sheet doesn't load? Do you have alt text, which you can't have on CSS, or are you using some sort of off-screen technique? What about SVGs? How are you calling those? Are you calling them for, via image elements, in which case it's an alt attribute? Are you calling them inline, in which case you might need uh, title attributes and description, or title elements, description elements, and then ARIA in order to all connect it? Is it just a, a weird inline base 64, calling it by reference, et cetera? You need to consider those techniques as well. And again, CSS generated symbols or icons can be a problem when they fail to render. Did, did anybody see that classic, classic Dutch style portrait of a woman that somebody made out of just CSS that was circulating on the web? It was awesome because people started to open it in old crappy browsers and it started to look very cubist and strange. And I thought it was a great example of all these techniques that we're coming up with to visually represent stuff can render in so many different ways now. And we're not always prepared for that. This is from Buffalo Soccer Club. It's an inner city youth soccer program I, uh, I, I helped start back when, um, back in the old days when I had my own company. It has a bunch of images on the page. We need to make sure that when the images don't load though, it still makes sense. All the context is still there as appropriate. When the logo goes away, I at least have alt text that says Buffalo Soccer Club. So screen reader will still say it, you can still see it on the screen. When the icons on the navigation go away, there's nothing to replace them. And that's actually okay. All they are is, is, is mostly decorative. They're providing a little bit of extra context, so I don't have to worry about doing anything special. When the picture of the kid goes away, the big happy kid about to kick a ball, who I think 30 seconds after I took this photo, face planted in the grass, because he stepped on the ball and it was thump. Oh yeah, we call it soccer for some reason, sorry. Um, it's strictly decorative. It's just a decorative image. Its absence doesn't change the meaning of the page. And I don't want a verbose alt text that says, here's the kid who did a face plant five seconds later. That's not useful for most readers, so we just completely exclude that. I'm just gonna be flying through things here. Typography. Typography is huge. It is incredibly important. Most of the information that people are interact with online is via text. Whether they read it, whether it's spoken to them, whether they zoom in on it, whether they print it out, highlight it, select it, paste it, email it, whatever. WCAG 2.1 came out uh, just over a week ago. WCAG 2.1 is WCAG 2.0 with some additional stuff on top of it. I'm gonna spare you all the details of what that means. But they've actually codified in there some of the rules so that if a user makes these changes, your page should not fall apart. If a user chooses to change the line height to 1.5 of the font size, your page shouldn't explode. There shouldn't be scroll bars everywhere. They, they should not be told to install some special software. Nobody should come knocking at their door. The same thing applies for after paragraphs, letter spacing, and word spacing. Independent of that stuff, good practices involve things like avoiding justified text. Don't have a block of text that goes all the way to the hard edge like newspapers do. Creates awkward gutters, rivers of white space can be difficult to read. Avoid italics. Italics have a purpose. They should be limited to those very specific purposes for titles or limited cases of emphasis. But italics should not be your, your go-to style. Use larger text. My favorite approach is to never set the base font size. I never set it. All I, the only time I ever set a font size, it's usually something like 150% if I want a, a, an H2. If um, I want to adjust the letting, it might be 1.5. Everything works off that base font size that the user has already chosen, whether the user chose to change it or decided that the browser default was completely adequate. Use good contrast. WCAG has a bunch of rules about that. Use clear, concise writing. Plain language, simple, direct, and to the point. There are, uh, give me just a moment. There is a typeface designed 
for people who have dyslexia. You might have seen this on the level level postcards that have um, best practices. I think we have some sitting in the front that Rihanna's gonna give out later. This might be useful for some users, and some users do note that it is useful, but you are not going to fix readability issues by choosing a, dyslexic, a dyslexia-specific typeface. Don't think that you can just give people the option to toggle and all of your problems have gone away. That is inadequate on its own. You need to follow the general good practices of typography. Question? What about um, Zoom? I'm sorry? And what about um, not allowed Zoom? Not, uh, I'm, uh, oh, Zoom. Yeah, so Zoom is a little bit different because um, Zooming, I don't qualify as a text thing, but users are gonna wanna Zoom, to Zoom in on icons, on buttons, on pieces of text. Allow it, don't ever disable it. It's a WCAG failure to disable it, but you want to allow people to zoom to whatever text size they want. And I think WCAG 2.1 has kicked it up to, it was 200%, I think they kicked up a little bit higher now before the page breaks. Does that answer your question? Sort of? Okay, we, we, then we may need to chat a little bit later. That's lovely of you to let me off the hook. I'm gonna take a drink now. That's still water. Hyperlinks. Um, Maya touched on a few of these. This is good things. Maya touched on a lot of this stuff. Rian touched on a lot of this stuff yesterday. I'm touching on it. It's well-known stuff that's heavily documented. So you don't even need to listen to me. You could all put your heads down and declare it nap time. Hyperlinks. If you see any cases where there's the, the link text itself is click here, more, link to, download, go away, that's a problem. If you're using all caps, that's a problem. If it's the entire link is a URL, that's a problem. Emoticons, emoji, does anybody remember emoticons? Are they still hip? No. They just became, for me they are. Yeah, colon right parenthesis. Emoji, emoticons, those are not very useful bits of link text. Uh, are you warning users before you open new windows? If you have target equals blank, what are you doing to tell the user? Is it more than an icon? Is it text that's available to a screen reader? Do links to downloads provide helpful info? Hey, you're about to download a 25 megabyte PDF of our menu. We only sell two kinds of hamburger, but here's a 25 megabyte PDF. Are you using pagination links? Not infinite scroll, but you know when you get to the bottom of the page, next page, can I jump to page seven? If it's an alphabet, can I jump to J or do I have to keep scrolling in, until insanity sets in? Are your links underlined? Like the simplest thing to do, are your links underlined? And if they're not underlined, are they otherwise obvious? Bold alone, no. Color alone, no. Underlines are the safest and simplest and I have a whole rambling article about this as well. If you're using images as links, is there alt text on those images and is the alt text appropriate for the link not just the image. So the alt text for an image might be different when you use it as a link. You should always consider that kind of context. And is the link text consistent? If I have a page that's about my company, and my company is Adrian Roselli LLC, whenever I'm linking to that about page, the link text should be or similar to about Adrian Roselli, about Adrian Roselli. If I ever have that guy, it's not an appropriate link for a number of reasons, but it should be consistent. I should be using the same text each time I use that URL. It breeds familiarity with your users. I, I want you to remember that you are not Google. Nobody in this room is Google. Okay, nobody corrected me on that, so I gambled and won. Uh, we all know Google's layout. We're all comfortable looking at the Google homepage and understanding what's a hyperlink and what isn't. Most users probably aren't visiting your site daily or your piece of content or doing that thing in your software. And if they are, maybe they don't care anyway. Relying on color alone for links won't be enough. Please underline them. If you are gonna use color, you need to follow contrast values that are already outlined in WCAG. This stuff's documented. Uh, this is from 2.0, which is still the same in 2.1. 2.1 goes further to point out, hey, if you're using icons and emoji, and other stuff. When I look at a page like this, I don't know what 
the hyperlink is. And when I've tested users with these pages, I found that users go to different places. Some go right to the image. Others try to get their cursor just right to click the title. Others just wing it around until it turns into a hand. Screen reader users, if they're unlucky, everything is announced as one link. And then they get very cross. Or worse, these are five different links. And they hear the same link with five different pieces of text. And they have to parse it every time. Yeah? Are buttons okay? Buttons should only be used to affect something on the page. Ahref is how you take people to a new page. If you're submitting a form, input type submit is totally fine. But if, a, if it's a call to action and visually it looks like a button, it should still be a link. And what about text in a block? What about text in a block like this? Tags. 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 Those are probably links. On, on my site, they are links because they load a brand new page with a different URL in the address bar. Well, yeah, I try to limit to only a handful of tags, but tag clouds, things like that, links. And then underlined. And underlined, yes. Now, I want to qualify the underline applies to content links. So you don't have to underline your sidebar links, your tag clouds, your navigation. Things that are part of the general layout, you don't need to underline. It's that in-content stuff that you need to make sure it stands out. Monique. In this case, I would underline the thing that I want to direct people to. If it's... but. There are different approaches, and I'm not telling you that any other way is wrong. I'm telling you if I was doing this, I would probably make the image and the heading the link, and the image would be decorative, and this, and this would be underlined. Yeah, it can, it can absolutely become noisy if you have too many underlines and there's too much going on on the page. And this is part of the thing about uh, web accessibility, is it's all about context and understanding the users and what you're doing here. Right. It's, so I'm making this general statement, your content links need underlines. They need underlines. Now, if you have special exceptions like your headers and you have a layout that very strongly conveys that that's a link, okay. But still, that's the kind of thing where you test it with users to be sure. Sort of related to the links thing, hit areas. Uh, WCAG 2.1 has just introduced uh, target size, but they've introduced it at AAA, which means you're probably never going to be required to honor it. Um, I think that was a mistake, but that's my opinion. That being said, we already know that some companies out there have made some standards relating to this, and these aren't the first. We can go back as long as graphical user interfaces have existed, since, since TOG was writing about this for Apple in the 80s, since IBM was playing around, since Xerox first created mouse interfaces. Hit areas need to be large enough to hit, whether you're using a fine pointer, a pen, or, or your meat stick on a train. You need to be able to tap it. And you need to leave space in between those tap areas. I, I'm, I'm so glad that I don't use Tinder, but if it was a tap instead of a swipe, I might tap the wrong person. That would be very awkward. I'm sorry, I didn't mean you. <laughs> Go away. Fitz Law is sort of relevant here because it talks about the time you spend to get to that target as a function of the size of that target. So how quickly can you use an interface based on how large an area is and how much space you have between them? Apple, in its guidelines, says you need a 44-point minimum size. Microsoft says 48 with a 2-millimeter spacing. Android says 48 with 8 device pixels. BBC has, it does not make, um, is, is not a platform. It makes interfaces and they have chosen seven millimeters inside an exclusion zone of seven millimeters. What's critical, what I want to point out here is we have points, pixels, device pixels, and millimeters. 
I can't seem to get anybody in the industry to go to arc minutes as an effective, use, an effective unit of measure because arc minutes are the best unit and I'll do a talk about that someday and you will all fall asleep. But until that day, just recognize that they have standards, figure out what your standard is, make sure that it makes sense. And I have links to all of these so you can read more about them. Make sure that it applies. This is Apple giving a good example. Um, meat stick with the small buttons, meat stick with bigger buttons. I have the tiny hands of an American. This is from Microsoft, and they've done a good job of identifying target size and the padding before the next target, so if I miss, I'm not accidentally hitting the wrong thing. Android, in their guidelines, similar thing. They show the spacing, they show some examples, and BBC showing it in the millimeters and the exclusion zones and all the spacing and all the recommendations around it. A lot of this stuff is pre-written. You don't need to invent this. You can just go steal it from somebody. I'm a big fan of stealing stuff. Color contrast. Uh, biggest question to ask is, is there enough contrast? Really important to know going into things. Can you tell what a hyperlink is in the rest of the page? That's part of the reason why underlines are, are so critical. Uh, are the menus obvious? Can you see that weird hamburger icon or the kebab icon if you're using Android, the, the three dots? It's a kebab. It's a kebab. I don't know what, otherwise it's, just, it's, it's, otherwise it's like three poops. And that's not cool. Um, apparently poops is a universal word. Who, who would have thought that? Um, WCAG 2.0 identifies contrast 4.5 to one for normal size text, which is the default text in the browser. And if you're doing large text, three to one. Also note that they do their sizing in points, which makes me angry. <sighs> Arc minutes, I'm telling you. I'm trying to get W3C to do it. WCAG 2.1 takes it a step further and says, by the way, your user interface components, like your buttons and your funky icons and your social media share things, etc., three to one. Three to one is not that hard to hit. Basically, it means don't put blue on blue. It's a little bit more than that. Um, as I mentioned, WCAG 2.1, typography, icons and glyphs, form elements, error messages, placeholders, hover focus, and selected states. Placeholders, by default, the placeholder color in your browser fails the contrast check. Against a white background, you need 767676 in order to meet the minimum contrast for your placeholder text. Oh, by the way, at that contrast setting, it looks like normal text. Maybe the field's been filled out, so maybe avoid placeholders. Hey, Rian, what's up? Firefox adds opacity to it, which makes it even trickier, so that's another thing you have to consider, consider overriding. Um, your hover focus and selected states need to be sufficiently different as well, so I can tell, hey, this is the page I'm on versus this is the thing I'm linking to. Uh, I'd also like to note red on black and red on white also fails the color contrast check, so you just need to work those colors a little bit more. These are the, this is the color palette from the Paciello group. This is from our style guide. And we've identified what our core colors are. We've also identified what combinations you can never use. This means if somebody is hired on our team, maybe we get a new marketing intern and, and, and he or she says, yeah, let's make these new postcards with accessibility standards, and we see this color, we'll just be able to say you didn't read the guidelines. You didn't, you didn't even have to eye drop it. All you had to do was not do that. And that's really an important thing to do if you have style guides or internal standards to document this kind of stuff. Label your fields. When you're working on a form, make sure that users, when they first come to that form, get all the instructions they need, the entire form. Tell them up front. Also provide a pro programmatic indication of required fields. And that could be with a required attribute and potentially in addition to ARIA required so you can catch all the screen reader users. Provide formatting advice. Tell them, hey, month, day, year, day, month, year, year, century, something, whatever it is, tell them in advance so that they're not being thrown back error messages. And a good developer is going to accept 
a multitude of formats anyway, as long as they can be parsed. Use ARIA to associate any formatting advice. ARIA described by is a great way to connect them. Avoid placeholder text, contrast issues, cognitive issues. It's not always easy to tell when a field has been filled out, uh, especially if um, you're using it in place of a proper label. Then what was that field I just filled out? Uh, I have to delete three fields to see. Associate error messages with fields programmatically, but also maybe if you have a block of error messages at the top of the page, first name is missing, provide a link. If it's a long form, I might appreciate you just taking me right to the field, especially if your error message style is terrible and I can't tell which field is broken. Think of it as a, as a, a good backup. Simplest way to do this though is use a label element. Make sure the for attribute corresponds to the label, to the input's um, ID attribute. A label text provides a larger hit area. So a little bit overlap before what I said about hit areas. Label text means that I can click the word and it'll put the focus in the field. I can click the word and it will toggle the checkbox or the radio button. Label text should generally appear above or to the left of text, uh, text inputs for left to right languages. If it's a checkbox or, ra or a radio button, put it after it, make it appear to the right. And if you have grouped fields, like a group of checkboxes or a group of radio buttons or a group of address information, wrap it in a legend and field set. If you don't like the styles that they provide and you can't override them, that's okay. You can rewrite that using ARIA. There are ARIA group roles you can use just in case anybody is a little bit worried about that. This happens to be, oh, I have audio on this one. I don't know if it's playing yet. Let's see. I'm in. This is Indiegogo using NVDA. What's the field? What's the field? I don't know what the field is. Indiegogo. Oh, here's the best part. And then when I leave the field, it erased it. Indiegogo does not work for screen reader users. It's a massive site. None of these are labeled properly. These aren't even placeholders. These are labels that they did not associate with the fields properly. The credit card number, credit card is about the only one that reasonably works. So th there are lots of sites out there that are successful and do it wrong. Being, being successful as a business just means you're leaving more money on the table. But here you can at least hear that it's announcing those fields. All these other fields, it did not provide the appropriate labels. Okay, did I do that right? Yes, yay. There's always a risk NVDA is gonna take over my machine and then it's gonna sound like a Cylon attack. Structure. Labels, by the way, are an awesome part of structure. Just in case you know, field set and legend, awesome part of structure. HTML5 already has this beautiful structure built into it through sectioning elements. The header, the nav, the main, only use one per page. A side footer and a form, maybe even your search form. If you use those elements, I, with a screen reader, can jump right to the main content of the page. I can jump to the footer. I can jump up to the header, or I can jump to the nav. If you have three navs on the page, that's okay. Label them. Label them. And there's, there are a bunch of tutorials on how to do that. It can be as simple as an ARIA label or visible text or whatever it is. But I can just press D to cycle through all the landmarks on the page in my screen reader. And there's a really cool plugin, the, the landmark plugin that Matthew Tiley Atkinson wrote. He's with the Pasiello group. Funny, all the awesome people are there. Um, whatever, ignore her. The, um, the landmark extension shows you all the landmarks in your page and will allow you to do landmark navigation with the keyboard as well. You don't even need a screen reader. It's kind of awesome. This is a layout that might look familiar to many of you. It's probably a web page. This web page is made accessible by ensuring I use the right HTML elements. And if I'm supporting a really old browser, I can just attach these roles, header role banner, main role main, nav role navigation, footer role, content info, 
I feel like somebody made a mistake there and it wasn't me. Form, role of search, aside, role of complementary. No, really, I don't know why they chose content info instead of just footer. I do, but it's a whole bike shedding conversation. Now, this might be the responsive layout of that same site. I, for, and by responsive, I'm specifically talking about the, the mobile narrow screen view. So if I turn my laptop sideways or I collapse my window. But all we've done is we've stacked that layout, that mobile first approach, and it's still the same stuff. Header, nav, form, main, aside, footer, if they get reordered, whatever's appropriate for your site. But by using HTML5's main landmark regions, you're already in good shape. In addition to that, use only H1, one H1 per page. The H1 should correspond to what the page is about. It should, it should correspond to the title element because that's why I'm here, that's the page I'm reading. It doesn't have the site name and the five colons and the bar and the other characters you put in there. But if it's about this company, H1 will probably be about this company. Don't skip heading levels. Don't go from an H1 to an H3. A screen reader user or somebody like me who might view uh, an outline view of a page will think that content is missing. Where'd the H2 go? Do I have to click something to display it? Uh-oh. To that end, use appropriate nesting. So if, you, if you're talking about dogs and then you talk about breeds and then you talk about Labradors, you would come back up if you're going to talk about places they live, all dogs or whatever it is. Make sure that that structure makes sense that you can parse it. There is no document outline algorithm. I, I, I don't know how many of you have heard about that before, but for those of you who have heard about the document outline algorithm, it is a fiction. It never existed. It was never in a final HTML specification. It was only ever in a draft. The document outline algorithm said all you had to do was use an H1 every time you used a section or article and the page would automatically figure out the proper structure and convey that. No browser ever wanted to support that. It doesn't exist. So just use good heading structures regardless of how you're using those elements. My general rule of thumb is anytime I open a section or an article, it should have a heading anyway because I'm really creating a new section of content, a new chunk of content. If I look at um, an article of mine and I just look at the heading structure, I can tell pretty quickly. There's what my page is about, be wary of guarantees. H2 would be evaluating vendors and tools, and then I have all these tips. Look for accessibility tickets, ask around. Step back out of that, what to do when you've been burned. Step out of that, some examples, and then I say sites that do it wrong. Typeform, Slack, Wix, Discus, Polar, etc. So I have some structure to this page. You can see how it's organized. And it's pretty easy to, to get this visually. Uh, there are a bunch of tools that do it. I use um, Chris Preterick's uh, Web Accessibility Toolbar. It has a document outline feature, and it shows me that view. And I use that when I do audits because it's awesomely handy. Other ways to structure your document includes using lists. Ordered lists, which put things in numbered order. If it matters what follows another thing, use an ordered list. If it doesn't matter, if it's a loose collection, unordered. And you can use description lists for key value pairs. Descriptions, definitions used to be their, their name in older, cooler versions of HTML. As an example, if you have a recipe, the instructions should be in order. Boil water, add pasta, drain water. If you drain the water before you add the pasta, you have a problem. That's why it's an ordered list. The order in which you put the pasta, water, and olive oil on the counter is irrelevant. This is just what you need to do it. And then the definition list, I need one pound of pasta, four quarts of water, not four quarts of olive oil. If you do that, let me know how it is. I've always kind of wanted to do that, just that big, just, yeah. I'm sure it'd be terrible. Be keyboard friendly. I think I have a bunch of slides on this one. Um, be careful with tab index. Tab index is dangerous. I see people add tab index to things in order to allow them to tab through a page. That's not necessarily a good idea. You use tab index negative one if you're going to use script to set focus on something, like a dialog that you've popped up. Uh, it does not put it in the tab order of the page. Tab index of zero, zero will 
allow the user to set focus to it. You'll see this in when people do a div tab index zero because they made it into a button because they hate their users. Tab index one or greater, don't do this. It totally messes with the tab order of the page. If you do tab index one, two, three, four, you can go visit a site and as soon as you start tabbing, you could get trapped in a crappy captcha, which often use a tab index of three, four, five, six, before you get into the skip page link. Positive tab index values will always get focus first on the page before the regular content on the page. So don't do that unless you want to force your users into your terrible nonsensical flow. If you have um, scrolling content boxes, that's a thing. You might want to uh, remember that keyboard users can't scroll those content boxes. They can see them, but they don't have a mouse. They don't have a mouse wheel. They can't put focus on it in order to make it scroll. If you have content that only displays on hover, remember that your keyboard users also probably cannot access it. A technique to get around that, like a scrolling area, would be to give it a role of region and an ARIA label so a screen reader user knows what it is, and then give it a tab index of zero. Now I can put focus on it, and when I do that, I can start to scroll. So in this table where all of the text gets clipped, I have scroll bars, and all I'm doing is tabbing through and then using my arrow keys. This is one where the text only expands on hover, but because I've given it a tab index and a focus style, the focus style matches the hover style, and it expands to show me the stuff. So there are cases where you can use stuff we tell you not to use, and it can actually benefit the user. The trick is to be keyboard friendly. Um, emoji are a thing, and I think I have video for this as well. Emoji are tricky because they sometimes convey too much or too little information. Um, I understand that peaches and eggplants are popular with the kids, or emoji. Am I wrong with that? Does eggplant translate? It's probably for the best I didn't put it up here then. It's the, it's the big purple. Aubergine, thank you. <laughs> So this is listening to it in NVDA. So using the mouse, I have a tutorial that shows you how to do this. And I also have it support a keyboard user by putting tab index on some of these. So that just the ones where I put tab index, you can tab to them and see what's going on. Let me try and play this again. Graphic poop. Graphic mouse. The idea here is I've taken something that's strictly visual and I've added support for a screen reader. And then I took something that is uh, keyboard only, or I'm sorry, mouse only, and I added keyboard support to it. And by the way, I use a mouse and I don't use a screen reader and I don't know what some of these really cool emoji are that the kids are using, so it adds value to me. Consider me a cognitively challenged user because I need that assistance. Oops, hey, look, that plays automatically. Uh, do not use div nor span as a control. They're not links. They are not buttons. They are not your really cool select menu. Try and find real controls first and foremost. If a control takes you to another URL, if you're moving somebody to another page, ahref. It's important to note, it does not fire on the spacebar. If I put focus on a hyperlink and I hit the spacebar, can anybody tell me what happens? I'll take that as no. If I hit space, when a link has focus, my screen, the page scrolls one screen full. So if you have a link that you're calling a button and maybe you put roll of button on it, Button does fire when I press the spacebar. So if you put roll a button, my screen reader will tell me it's a button. I'm going to hit the spacebar because it's the biggest key on the keyboard and nothing's going to happen because you're using the wrong element and you're recasting it and lying to the user about what it is. If the control changes something on the current page, just use a button. Type button. It's that simple. If you're submitting a form field, input type submit, button type submit, for internal style reasons, code style reasons, I, um, I always counseled my clients to use an input type submit so they wouldn't mentally confuse it with a button. I would try to get them to think 
input type submit for forms, button type button for opening and closing boxes on the page and scrolling and doing stuff like that versus a link which takes me to another page. It's really easy to style this stuff. One of those is a button, one of those is a link, one of those is an input type submit. But they all look exactly the same. There's really no reason to use the wrong element. You can make them look however you want. Make sure that you define focus styles. Anywhere that you have a hover style, add the focus selector. So when I put my cursor over something, if it changes color, if it catches fire, if it sends an email to my grandmother, make it do that when I tab to it as well. Make sure that you don't have this style in your style sheets. If you're using a CSS reset, if you ever see outline none, unless you have a damn good reason for using it, just remove that. Just get rid of it. By default, at least stuff will work. Generally, don't rely on browser defaults. You can test this just with the tab key. You can tab around pages and you should know where you are at all times. There are cases though, where you will see pretty quickly how the browser default is wildly insufficient. This is a screenshot from Chrome. I'm on a Google page. This Google page is telling me how to use Chrome. And I'm tabbing through it with my keyboard and the default focus outline is blue. And the default background color of their navigation bar is a very similar blue. So I can't even see, you might be able to see, I mean, I can see it, but further back, you might not be able to see it. So don't rely on the, the browser defaults, create good styles. Make sure that they work the same for keyboard and mouse users. Um, this is me trying to use the now gone Virgin America site. If you look down here, you can see the URL keeps changing. I'm tabbing through the page. I'm trying to see where I am on the page. I have no idea where I am on the page until it scrolls. It scrolled, awesome. I still don't know where I am. No, nope, still not a clue, the page keeps scrolling. I'm hitting the tab key, no idea. And it isn't until I get to the very bottom of the page that I start to get a sense of where I might be. This site, the Virgin America site, again, thankfully shut down now. Uh, the Virgin America site won all sorts of accolades, design awards, it got articles in popular Condé Nast magazines, whatever. And it was a wildly unusable site. And one day they said, we're gonna make it accessible. So they hired a third party and they added a link that says, see the accessible version. And the accessible version was worse. Those of us in the accessibility community just piled on, we had so much fun. It was just this Twitter game of, of who could find the next most annoying thing. Didn't work with the screen reader. Their, their groups of radio buttons weren't unique. So you could select all the radio buttons at once. The colors were wrong. There were no graphics, but they had weird image tags. It was just a mess. And that probably would not have happened if they just left their focus outlines on because then we wouldn't have started picking on them and made them feel they had to respond as poorly as they did. Display versus source order. This is something that people often forget about. Um, you can use CSS to reorder your code. So you can have your, your code can be, you know, a heading and a block of content and more blocks of content and more headings. And you can use CSS floats or absolute positioning to rearrange it. You've been able to do that for a really long time. And it's always been a potential problem. With Flexbox and Grid, it becomes even more of a potential problem. Specifically because you can use the order property in Flexbox to rearrange things on the page. The catch, of course, is that Visually, it might look one way, but it might be announced a different way. Giving instructions to somebody can suddenly be meaningless. Whether they're just seeing differently than what they're hearing, or the mobile or the desktop version have reordered the content, or their CSS is broken, they're on an older browser that doesn't support Flex or Grid. The behavior of how the browsers handle this stuff might be different. Firefox no longer does it this way. They've changed. But the idea was you could reorder stuff. So in this example, it will at least jump one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, because that's the order it appears in the code. Over here, it doesn't go one, two, three, four. It goes in the order that it appears on the screen as I'm tabbing through that page. These are two dramatically different experiences and they're just two different browsers. 
I preferred the way that Firefox did it because it was following the code order and I felt that it would force authors to do a better job of managing that. But Firefox eventually went that way, which is confusing for users, uh, screen reader users, sighted screen reader users, and people following instructions. You've heard me talk a couple times about how I'm repeating things you say for the benefit of captions. Are we really that low on time? Bear in mind, everybody uses captions and subtitles. I have seen rare cases of there been other than totally blind people who don't use them in some setting, regardless of your circumstances. They should include an audio description. They should include the speaker identification so you know who it is who's talking. Uh, there's a great site, Craptions, nomorecraptions.com, where you can upload your captions from a YouTube video and you can re review them to see if they are any good and you can fix the really terrible stuff, like this is a talk I gave in um, Sweden, while so long to his Viagra. I think what he was saying is, this is Adrian Roselli. Um, do all your video audio clips have text alternatives? Are the links to closed captions or transcripts built into the player, or are they a separate text link? So if the player doesn't even load, can I at least download that transcript? Is there an audio description available? I have a bunch of tools that you can reference later on. I don't want to go too deeply into ARIA, partly because I'm running out of time. Um, ARIA stands for Accessible Rich uh, Internet Applications, and the idea was it's a bridging technology between novel interactions and screen readers and other devices that will support it. The idea was that um, HTML5 doesn't have patterns for things like tabbed interfaces, and accordion interfaces, and ARIA is there to help patch that up until an element might appear. So while the HTML team discusses panels and panel sets that would take the place of carousels and tabs and accordions, you can use ARIA to sort of spackle over that. There are some rules to using ARIA. Use a native HTML5 element first. Don't just start throwing ARIA at stuff. Look for the element that does the job. Don't change native semantics. Do not change an H1 into a button. Do not change a link into a button. Different interactions, different behaviors. All interactive ARIA controls must work with the keyboard. They have to be able to perform equivalent actions. If your users can't do that, you got a problem. You either got to fix your ARIA or come up with a different interaction. Do not use role presentation or aria hidden true on an element that can receive focus because a screen reader will never know it's there. These basically say this doesn't exist. And by allowing them to put focus on it, you're going to confuse the situation because they'll never be able to get to it. Every interactive element must have an accessible name. There must be a programmatic name associated with the control. Sometimes it's visible, like the text in a button. Sometimes it comes from something like the alt text on an image. It's usually very easy to satisfy, but make sure that you are at least providing that. You can test that in a screen reader. There are all these really cool pre-built pattern libraries that you can lean on to pull a lot of this information. Um, pattern libraries are a great way to document all the rules for your custom widgets. Pattern libraries allow you to define things like, these are the keyboard shortcuts it needs to honor. These are the different states that it has. These are the things to click. These are the messages when it goes wrong. Individual widgets can be used to put together a larger pattern library. The ARIA authoring practices guide already has a pre-built pattern library. You can go steal a ton of stuff from them. It's like already built. Much of the code is already there. The keyboard interaction is already defined. Um, it's not perfect, but it can help you out. If you've got a really, really custom widget you've never seen before, like a, a DDR style interface, if you make people dance in front of their computer, ARIA is not going to help you. It's probably just a terrible interface. This is an example from the ARIA authoring practices. That's from their practices. This is just a terrible mock-up of it. But it tells you, what's the tab order? As I tab through it, what happens? What are the different roles and states that I pull out of ARIA to tell me what it does? What are the different behaviors that we're going to see? BBC has done a beautiful job with its pattern libraries. The BBC has gone so far as to identify um, what the label text should say, what the images sizes should be, what comes first in the tab order. 
They include things like this should be an H2. This is also an H2. They provide detail that's great for somebody on the design team and for somebody on the development team and everybody in between to be able to implement these patterns. And they don't run the risk of having a new developer come up and invent something new or break an existing pattern. I told you there were four exercises, right? Yeah, four. This is the fourth and final one. I feel like I should have started this sooner because like three of you were asleep and they're all re on. <laughs> so here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that user interface element and I want you to talk about, make some notes, draw on it, whatever it is, how you might code it. Think about those disability categories that you each individually were representing earlier. Think about that persona that you came up with. Um, Hannah, Adriana, um, random guy. Matt. I'm terrible at this game. And think about those, the changing needs that they're going to have, those different contexts. You know, somebody might be totally able to use it in one context, but you know, if, if Hannah's at a dance club, she's not going to be able to use Tinder in the same way. Why do I keep going back to Tinder? Anyway, take uh, 15 minutes and write something up. And my plan is to wrap this up relatively quickly so we can get you out of here to a reasonable time because I think I have like five slides at the end of this. So go nuts. <laughs> what?
Just a heads up, I was informed that I need to let you out with enough time to get to the closing remarks. So we're gonna, we're gonna go just a few more minutes. I'm sorry, I, I'm not giving you as much time as I had hoped to. We're just gonna go a few more minutes and then what I wanna do is just have you quickly report and then we can run through my last five slides and I can set you free. Yes, I like 
Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm going to cut this exercise short. I'm sorry to do that, mostly because I wanted to see what you came up with. What I'm going to do is, in order to um, manage it in the time that we have, is I'm going to give each group the microphone, and I want you to very quickly tell me what your interface element is, and a thing, let's just do one thing, that you did to accommodate uh, users and that, that benefit. So let's hear from your group. One thing? We yeah, do, let's, let's we do one thing. Okay, so if you do it quickly, we'll do a second thing. So what was your interface component? Uh, it was a sign-up form. Sign-up form. For something. Okay. Uh, and um, we uh, made the checkboxes, uh, the, sorry, the fields uh, without the placeholder, but with the tag. Um, the label above, tag. Above, uh, label tag, yeah. Uh, we also added icons next to each field to uh, let them know, uh, let maybe the dyslexic people know easier uh, what's the label about? For example, f in the name and uh, last name, we put a little uh, uh, icon of uh, a person. Okay. At the email, we put the ads uh, symbol. Um, yeah, etc. And uh, we try. We use the big fonts in our minds, and we uh, added a big checkbox and a big button so that they can click uh, on it easily. Okay. I, I looked at your checkbox, and what I like is that you have all of the text after the checkbox in the label as well. So they have a huge hit area. I could press it with my elbow from across the room. Somebody from this table, tell me what your interface component is and, and a thing or two or maybe more of what you did. Okay, our uh, component is um, um, a shopping cart page, but the product description area of that. A oh, product page, okay. Yeah, well, no, no it's the, the, the shopping cart, but people can see like what products they've put in their shopping oh, okay. cart. Yeah, but not all the other stuff that's in the shopping cart. Okay. Um, so we have like the product name underlined, so they can go back to the product, so they know it's a link. And we have a product image, so they can refer to the stuff they're actually buying. And uh, we have a quantity box with uh, big up and down arrows, so people can increase, uh, or decrease. increase or decrease. And we were actually struggling with the way we were displaying the price, like show the regular price, show what's the discount, uh, is the price displays the discount, or should you put a minus or a percentage? We we're trying to figure it out. That was a hard part. If it's any consolation, there are a lot of people who do e-commerce for accessibility who struggle with the best way to convey what's the original price, what's the sale price, how much is the discount, without providing too much information, without overloading the user. Yeah. What's cool is that I think I think there are some case studies on this online. I can't remember who off the top of my head, sadly. Thank you. All right. Who from here? You're holding the pen. Does that mean it's you? Anybody? Oh, come on. I think she just assigned you. So what's your interface component? What's your interface component and some of the considerations you made? It's, uh, it's just a, a form to be filled in order to send a, to send a message to, uh, to complete information, to ask for more uh, contact for more information. Okay. So just have uh, four fields with name, surname, email, and message, then uh, GDPR consent, and uh, um, a validation control for uh, a recaption. Okay. And uh, a send uh, button. We considered uh, just the possibilities of having uh, big uh, elements so that can, that can be easily clickable. We were considering also the fact that, that uh, GDPR consent uh, to be given through uh, not with a checkbox but with a, um, a radio button with the message button 
so that yeah. it can be uh, recognized, um, selectable also from by, for blind people. And uh, um, we just have a, a black and white uh, interface, so with okay. not any particular color added to it, so that it is uh, accessible for everyone without uh, any information conveyed through uh, color. Okay, that that's that's an interesting choice. We usually don't recommend going black and white because you can convey valuable information with color to people who can still see color. Okay. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just an interesting choice. And I don't know, based on your persona, that might be totally appropriate because I don't know her intimately. She, she declined my Tinder. <laughs> I really got to stop with that. All right. Thank you very much. Ideally, if I had planned more time, we would do a little bit more in depth. I just have a, a, a few last minute slides and then I'm gonna set you free as long as I hit the right button here. Part, part of my job as, a, as an accessibility consultant is not to tell you you can't do a thing. I'm not supposed to be the one who says you, you, can't, you, you can't make that cool design. I'm supposed to be the guy who makes sure that you can do it and build it accessibly. There's a risk when you build things following a checklist. You can end up with something that is wildly inaccessible. This ramp integrated into stairs will kill somebody in a wheelchair, either by slamming them into a wall or sending them into the pit of crocodiles. And people like me who take the stairs two at a time are gonna trip every few steps. And they got to that because they followed a checklist. At the same time, you have to remember that it's about maintenance. So you can have a ramp that's totally accessible, but if you put a potted tree on it in the middle of winter, you've taken an affordance that you built and made it completely inaccessible. It's an ongoing process. It's not a checklist. And that's the thing I, I also want you to, to keep in mind as you leave here. I will upload the slides. I will tweet the URL of them. And that is it. My talk is over, I think, just at the point that I negotiated. So bye.